Thank you for tuning in to The Journey. I am Bob Glaze, President and General Manager of Southwest Radio Church. With me is Pastor Larry Spargimino. Words are powerful. They can be used to build up or to tear down. Proverbs 15.4 tells us that a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Not all words are a tree of life. Some words stir up anger. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. In the following film segment, you will see and hear an imam from California call on Allah to annihilate Jews. Muslim preacher Amah Shaheen spoke in English and Arabic about how all Muslims, not only Palestinians or Syrians, will be called upon to kill the Jews on the last day. Shaheen is not quoting the Quran, but the Hadith, oral tradition of sayings attributed to Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Shaheen observes that this Hadith does not say where the final battle will take place. If it is in Palestine or another place, the Imam says, perhaps hinting at the possibility that such a battle could happen in the United States or Europe. Shaheen also prayed that Al-Aqsa Mosque be liberated from, quote, the filth of the Jews. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the situation of people. Until they change their own situation. The Prophet says that the time will come, the last hour would not take place till the Muslims fight the Jews. And we don't, we don't say if it's in Palestine or other, till they fight. And when that war breaks, that they would run and hide behind every rock and house and wall and trees. The house and the wall and the trees will call upon the Muslims. It will say, O oh, Muslim. It will not say, O oh, Palestinian, O oh, Egyptian, O oh, Syrian, O oh, Afghani, O oh, Pakistani, O oh, Indian. No, it will say, Ya yeah, Muslim, O oh, Muslim, Muslim. When Muslims comes back. Come, there is someone behind me. إِلَّا شَجَرَ الْغَرْقَدِ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْ شَجَرِ يَهُودِ Except a certain tree that they are growing today in Palestine, in that area, except this form of tree that they are growing today, that, that's the tree that will not speak to the Muslims. اللهم إنا نسألك نصرة المسجد الأقصى وسائر بلاد المسلمين اللهم حرر المسجد الأقصى من أدناس اليهود اللهم عليك بمن أغلق المسجد الأقصى يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا فيهم يوما أسودا وأرنا فيهم عجائب قدرتك اللهم أهلكهم بددا وأحصهم عددا ولا تغادر منهم أحدا اللهم حرر المسجد الأقصى يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل ذلك على أيدينا واجعل لنا نصيبا منه يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اجعلنا ممن ينصرونهم بالقول والعمل اللهم اجعلنا ممن ينصرونهم بالقول والعمل اللهم اجعلنا ممن ينصرونهم بالقول والعمل شاهين was born in Egypt and holds a degree in Islamic studies. He came to the United States in 1999 and obtained a degree in computer engineering. He is an instructor of the Zadani Islamic Institute. As I viewed this clip, I thought, this is why Muslims are coming to Christ. Many of them realize there's got to be something better than sowing the seeds of hatred and death. We need to pray for Imam Shaheen and others all over the world that they would realize their need of a true spiritual makeover that only comes from the new birth. God forms, sin deforms, education informs, but only Christ transforms. Like so many people in the modern world, Americans are health conscious. We are warned of the dangers of smoking and are reminded to wash your hands before you eat. But recent data is showing conclusively that refugees and illegal immigrants are causing a surge of infectious diseases in both the United States and Europe. In a recent WorldNet Daily report, Dr. Elizabeth Lee Vliet, a member of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, states that refugees and illegal immigrants are bringing diseases previously eradicated or rarely seen into the Western world. 
She reports that the media and health officials are ignoring the data or attacking those who are sounding the alarm as xenophobes. The dire warnings and early predictions given by courageous physicians and cultural observers are now coming true. This is especially evident in Germany since 2015 when Angela Merkel began allowing more than 2 million migrants from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East to flood into her country. Citizens are put at risk by the champions of open borders and their politically correct acceptance of unscreened immigrants from countries with a high prevalence of infections, diseases, many of which are difficult or impossible to treat. According to the July 2017 Infectious Disease Epidemiology Annual Report by the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, Germany, there has been a surge in chickenpox, cholera, dengue fever, tuberculosis, leprosy, measles, malaria, meningococcal disease, hemorrhagic fevers, hepatitis, HIV AIDS, paratyphoid, rubella, shigellosis, syphilis, typhus, toxoplasmosis, tularemia, trichinosis, whooping cough, and many fungal and parasitic infections. According to the World Net Daily report, a similar pattern has emerged in the U.S. since the massive increase in illegal border crossers and refugees under the Obama administration. In both the U.S. and Europe, many hundreds of thousands of migrants disappear into cities and towns across the U.S. and Europe. There's no way to monitor them for disease or to ensure adequate treatment. Citizens are exposed without their knowledge. The risks are especially serious for children and the elderly. This is a massive humanitarian crisis. It does not even solve the problems for the refugees or the illegal aliens since few are treated properly. No one can claim open borders is an act of compassion. It only perpetuates misery and suffering for all parties. Progressive politicians often say, America is the land of immigrants or America is great because of her immigrants. In the past, this meant legal immigrants who followed our screening procedures for illness, and who followed other laws and provisions for a growing population. In the past, Ellis Island Immigration Center in New York City was where new arrivals were examined, quarantined if needed, or sent back to their country of origin if they posed a risk to Americans. The left's attack on common sense is no more obvious than its insane attack on those who see the need to protect both Americans and the immigrants. An amazing amount of information has been revealed through research and study focusing on the ancient race of giants described both in the Bible and by ancient historians. Bible researchers as well as archaeologists have focused on the bones of giants found in great number on the Italian island of Sardinia. In this segment, we will bring the latest developments to our viewers. In Genesis 6, verse 4, we read, There were giants in the earth in those days. There are several other references to giants. The Moabites and the Edomites and other ancient groups bore record of their existence. Giants were identified as the Amim, the Anakim, and the Zamzumim. In Deuteronomy chapters 2 and 3, we find references to the giants in Canaan. In Deuteronomy 2 verses 10 and 11, Moses said, The Amims dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites call them Emims, close quotes. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, Moses says, quote, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Reboth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, unquote. This bedstead was made of iron so that it could support the weight of the king Og, the giant king. The bed was more than 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. When the spies returned from spying out the land of Canaan, they said, quote, We are not able to go up against the people because they are stronger than we. They gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is the land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, 
which come from the giants. And in our eyes, we were like grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes, close quotes. That's from Numbers chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. Some commentators believe that the report of the giants was a big lie. There were no giants. The spies were just making this up. That's why it was an evil report. However, the report was evil because of their fear. The core of the evil report is found in verse 31, quote, We are not able to go up against the people because they are stronger than we, unquote. They did not have faith in God's promise to give them this land. They were claiming that God was sending them into an impossible situation. In the two-hour video, The Holocaust of Giants, you will see and hear some amazing testimonies about Native Americans in the Four Corners area of the United States. It tells of ancient Indian lore that bears a striking resemblance to the biblical account of giants. We would like to send you this video in a few minutes. We will tell you how you can get the video, The Holocaust of Giants. Yes, Larry, it's, it challenges some of the cover-ups in different parts of the world regarding the giants. The video takes the viewer to the island of Sardinia off the Italian coast. You will see the neurogic tombs and how they have been built over the graves of giants, graves that have huge bones in them. The entrances to these neurogic tombs are very small. The entrances were not used by the giants. They would have never have been able to fit through those small entrances. It is believed that in ancient times, young boys crawled through these small entrances to sleep over the bones of the giants to absorb the power of these men of renown, spoken of in Genesis 6, verse 4, the Gibberine. They may have been communicating with the spirits of the dead, a practice known as necromancy. It was predicted by the ancient Canaanites and strictly forbidden in the Bible. There is strong archaeological evidence that the neurogic civilization on Sardinia was founded by the Canaanites, the ancient inhabitants of what is now the land of Israel. According to the Bible, the Canaanites were driven out of the Promised Land during the Hebrew conquest under the leadership of Joshua. Most significant is the fact that stone columns have been found on Sardinia bearing the words, and I quote it, we are the Canaanites who fled before the face of Joshua the robber, the son of Nun. Close quotes. This is material proof that the neurogic civilization came from Canaan. There are several significant facts that emerged from recent research in Sardinia. First of all, there are bones and artifacts of giants in Sardinia. These large bones are not the bones of horses or cattle. Secondly, there is a strong oral tradition of giants on the island of Sardinia. In the book, Unearthing the Lost World of the Cloud Eaters, Dr. Tom Horn shares recent research on the evidence of giants in the American Southwest. There is an interview with a Dr. Mose, a Native American who recited Old Testament history and how it is very similar with Navajo beliefs in giants. Ancient Navajo Indian myths and legends seem to be woven in with the biblical understanding of the six days of creation and the arrival of the Nephilim. Also in the ancient legends is the judgment by a global flood followed by the repopulating of peoples around the world and a second incursion of giants. Dr. Mose has written an illustrated book that is used by Native American schools and libraries. Dr. Mose said, and I quote him, You know when the Christian missionaries first came to America and told our people their stories of the giants and the great flood, we smiled and let them know we had already heard these tales long ago from our ancestors." Close quotes. Recent documents and research are providing more evidence on the great antiquity of the biblical stories. Their validity as historical narrative, quote, the Holocaust of Giants, unquote, will provide you with 101 minutes of viewing. You won't want to miss this opportunity to be brought up to date on the latest information. Along with the movie, we would love to send you Unearthing the Lost World of the Cloud Eaters. You'll be able to read the in-depth report of the mysterious disappearance of the Anasazi Indians and other secrets of America's earliest history. Our toll-free number is 1-800-652-1144. The running time for the movie that Bob mentioned is 101 minutes. The book Cloud Eaters is 493 pages in length. As chronicled by Dr. Tom Horn and researcher Stephen Quayle, two teams of investigators and film crews will bring you compelling information 
that will impact your life. Our toll-free number is 1-800-652-1144. A Christian couple is looking to add wedding videos to their business portfolio. They're suing the state of Minnesota after officials there made it clear that laws require anyone working as a wedding vendor to accommodate same-sex couples. Carl and Angel Larson operate Telescope Media Group. In a statement provided by their attorneys at Alliance Defending Freedom, the Larsons contend their business, quote, exists to tell great stories that honor God, close quotes. It also points out that the Larsons are expanding their wedding video services to reanimate the hearts and minds of people about the goodness of marriage between a man and a woman. But the state of Minnesota is placing a major hurdle in front of their business plans. Their attorney, Jeremy Tedesco, says that they are unable to do so because the state says that if they do them for their marriages that are consistent with their beliefs, marriages between a man and woman They have to do them on behalf of same-sex marriages as well. The state of Minnesota has said that the law bars discrimination, even if the discrimination grows out of religious beliefs. The law has said that people working in the wedding industry must promote concepts of marriage, including same-sex marriage, that they disagree with, even if that violates their religious beliefs. Punishing for wedding vendors refusing to accept same-sex clients can be up to 90 days in jail and hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. Will a preemptive lawsuit be effective? No one knows how it will all turn out. However, the stakes are high. There are activists on the left who are pushing very hard for these same kinds of laws to be adopted in states that don't have them. There are at least 20 states that have similar laws right now, and activists want all 50 states to have them. Is today's far left possessed? That's the title of an article in WorldNet Daily's Whistleblower for July 2017. The author, John Zamerick, writes, We are not just dealing with bad ideas, but evil spirits. Zamerick sees some parallels in modern America and Europe to Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel, The Possessed. A band of youth emerge in a sleepy town. They have no positive program for reforms, not even ideas for a revolution. Instead, their goal is to tear down everything around them, including family, church, private property, and clear-headed thinking. Those who oppose their destructive ideas are labeled as being ignorant buffoons. The real criminals in the novel, however, are the defenders of the old order. They are in a state of denial and lie to themselves. They don't want anyone to move them out of their comfort zone. They hope for at least one more night of sleep. Zmirak says that Dostoevsky was talking about 2017. In the article, Zmirak says national leaders are taking the same approach to radical Islam. Surely there really can't be millions of people living in Western countries who yearn for a 7th century Islamic theocracy. Surely there are no people in America or Europe who wish to repay the hospitality of Swedes, Germans, Frenchmen, and Americans by imposing Islamic Sharia law on them. Only intolerant Western extremists would even think of such a thing. In the Dostoevsky novel, the author hints at the real problem. The people are possessed by demons. Dostoevsky even refers to the biblical story of the gathering demoniac and his self-destructive behavior. The question immediately comes to mind, is this the real problem in the world today? Was Dostoevsky right in seeing the real problem as going far beyond human depravity? What is the role of the demonic in current events? Is there any connection between the pits of hell and the corruption and confusion in the modern world? If we can believe the biblical worldview, the answer is an emphatic yes. 1 Kings chapter 22 tells how the doom of King Ahab was engineered by Almighty God through the use of spiritual entities, spirit beings who are intelligent and volitional. The prophet Micaiah has a vision of the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him. 
there on his right and on the left of the Lord. The Lord asked his armies, Who can entice Ahab to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so he can be killed? The Bible tells us there was a big discussion, and finally a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. The Lord asked, How will you do this? The spirit replies, I will go out and inspire all of Ahab's prophets to speak lies. 1 Kings 22, verse 23 tells us, Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. In this amazing passage, we see that God instructed one of the divine counsel to be a lying spirit in the mouths of prophets consulted by King Ahab before the battle that claimed the king's life. There is a vast unseen realm that surrounds us, invisible but very real. Volitional entities can enter in and out of this dimension at will through what some have called portals or stargates. In Revelation chapter 4, we read that John looked and saw a door opened in heaven. That is, one might call this a portal, an opening. A voice says, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately says John, I was in the spirit. This reminds us that one cannot enter this extra dimensional realm in the flesh. John is taken up and he says, And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now these are not earthly creatures, but extra dimensional entities. In normal speech and in writing, we sometimes personify inanimate objects. An example is the phrase, the flowers danced in the gentle breeze. Here the flowers are said to dance. In our modern world, we are prone to psychologize things. A person with some kind of an emotional problem has what is called a syndrome. Mental health workers have labeled dozens of syndromes and disorders. There's the cracked tooth syndrome, the Down syndrome, the Asperger syndrome. But the Bible doesn't psychologize behaviors. It often demodifies behaviors. Numbers 5.14 speaks twice about a spirit of jealousy, suggesting that there is a spiritual connection to jealousy. 1 Samuel 28.7 says the witch of Endor had a familiar spirit. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is unhappy with the church at Thyatira because the church allows that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication. It is doubtful if that was her actual name. This was a woman who was motivated by a spirit of Jezebel, referring to the manipulative wife of King Ahab. Going back to the whistleblower article cited earlier, author John Mirak is justified in the statement that, quote, we're not just dealing with bad ideas, but evil spirits, close quotes. Is today's far left possessed? Can anyone doubt it? We see a lot of angry people in the world. There is insane outrage, bitterness, and anger. Manipulative leaders are creating anger in their followers to accomplish their own evil ends. Riots don't just happen, just like a fire doesn't just happen. I want to suggest that we think on a biblical truth that is so important in this age of rage. Circumstances don't determine destiny. Think of Joseph, the son of Jacob. He suffered because of some bad circumstances. It was during a time of trial that God was able to transform Joseph. How would you respond if you were hated by your own brothers? They considered Joseph a dreamer and tried to remove him from the scene. Come on now, let's kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns and tell our father that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. And it got worse. After Joseph was thrown into a pit, his brothers sold him as a slave. Now picture Joseph, tied to the back of a camel, bouncing through the desert. More bad circumstances. Some would say lots of bad luck. Things begin to improve, or so it seems. Eventually, Joseph is made head over Potiphar's house because of his strength of character. But there is a problem. Mrs. Potiphar tries to seduce him. 
Joseph did not respond as she had hoped. How can I do this great evil and sin against God, he said. Angry at being rebuffed, Mrs. Potiphar has thrown Joseph into prison under false charges. The lady of the house is a liar. The story of Joseph doesn't end there, however. Pharaoh heard of Joseph's ability to interpret dreams and, disturbed by a series of dreams that didn't make sense to him, Pharaoh asked Joseph what his dreams meant. Joseph was able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, and by way of appreciation, Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of Egypt. Joseph went from prisoner to prime minister in one day. Genesis chapter 42 tells us that a great famine came upon the land of Egypt, but because of Joseph's depth of understanding, Egypt was prepared for the worst. Everyone had to come to Egypt if they wanted to survive the famine, including Joseph's brothers and his father. For 20 years, Joseph had carried the pain of personal betrayal, but when he saw his brothers, he ducked out of sight and wept. He could have had them punished, sent away without food, or even executed. Joseph, however, saw beyond his pain and those bad circumstances. He knew that circumstances do not determine destiny. The Bible tells us that Joseph brought all of his family to live with him. He saved them from famine. Now, why is that really important? Well, Joseph had a brother named Levi who had a daughter named Jochebed. She would become the mother of Moses, the one whom God would use to deliver Israel from bondage. How you and I handle our circumstances today will determine the heroes of tomorrow. Your future and my future is not dependent on circumstances. It's dependent on how we react to circumstances. As was true with Joseph, your surroundings don't have to determine your destiny. When I see all the rage in the world and all the blame shifting, my desire is that multitudes of people would come to accept this truth. Circumstances don't determine destiny. Thank you, friends, for being with us. Our journey is becoming quite an adventure. When I came to Oklahoma in 1998 to serve the Lord at Southwest Radio Church, I had no idea what we would be seeing in 2017. As Jesus said, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. God has put all of us here on planet Earth for such a time as this. We can have hope because God is still on the throne and prayer changes things.